Good morning. Excited to be here with you all this morning. I am really, really pumped about this series. I know we're, we're most of the way through it, uh, but this has just been a real joy uh, to, to go through, to talk about God's greatness. And hopefully we talk about God's greatness, the, the, the bigness, if you will, of God every week, but to really focus in on it has been a real uh, blessing for me. And this week we're talking about God's providence, his sovereignty, the way that God controls and provides for his creation. And as I thought about control, my mind went to a time in my life when I lost control. I was driving to work uh, as a college student. I was heading down a road. I've traveled down many times in my life in Marietta, Georgia, and I lost control of my vehicle. And I slammed into the brick entrance of a subdivision, of a, of a neighborhood. And fortunately for me, uh, according to God's providence, uh, the, the entrance to the subdivision was kind of webbed, so it wasn't like a solid brick, it just kind of gave way. Uh, there was a telephone pole that was about a foot to my left, dodged that, again, God's providence and care in my life. And then probably the biggest blessing for me of all, and I think about a lot actually, was there was a man who was gardening in his yard that the brick entrance backed up against to. And uh, he fortunately was gardening on the other side of his yard, but had he been mowing his grass, uh, it would have been bad. It would have been really bad. And so I lost control of my vehicle, destroyed it. I mean, my 94 Pontiac Grand Prix uh, went to be where old cars die, uh, wherever that may be. Um, but it, again, it just, it's an amazingly terrifying thing when you lose control of your vehicle. And I think in our world, it can sometimes feel like nobody's at the wheel of the universe. And it just kind of feels like things are, are out of control sometimes. I mean, this year, uh, 2020 and all that's happened in it has really felt like things are kind of, if not out of control, spinning close to out of control, like uh, you're hydroplaning and you're just trying to get everything settled. Maybe in your personal life, things have felt out of control. Uh, it can feel like we're just kind of always on the edge of disaster and that maybe, despite our faith in the Lord, maybe he's not really got everything under control, like I hope. So what I would like to talk about today as we look at God's providence is to think about the ways in which I can rest in God's control rather than uh, resting in my own control. Now again, providence, sovereignty is a big topic. We've got about 30 minutes to cover it. Um, uh, Jeff told me this morning that I think John Piper's written a 700 page book on the providence of God. Uh, so I'll try to cram 700 pages worth of stuff into 30 minutes. Um, but we're gonna start in Romans 8. Uh, 18 and use that as a springboard to kind of look at some other passages and really look at three things that tell us about God's providence that we can rest in his control for. And so the first one is we can trust God to hold all things together. We can trust God to hold all things together. One of the major discussions in scripture is the idea of suffering. Suffering is, is a big deal. God, are you there? Are you, are, you, are you caring? Are you gonna stop this injustice that's happening to me? And it goes throughout scripture. And one of the major sort of unique discussions on suffering is found in Romans 8:18. 8, Paul writes, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time, the Roman church, the church at large, are not worth comparing with the glory that's to be revealed in us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Now what's happening here? Our hope, the central hope of the Christian is that when we die, because of Christ's resurrection, we will one day be resurrected in a real body, in a, in a glorified body, just like Christ, and we will dwell eternally with him in a new heaven and a new earth. And that's been historically one of the ways in which we respond to suffering as Christians. If you're going through a difficult time, one of the things you can look forward to, not the only thing, is that God is going to restore all things and going to redeem all things and that my suffering is going to be translated into this future glory. And apparently, according to Paul, we're not the only ones waiting for the suffering to end. Because if you remember in Genesis 3, when man sins, creation is cursed. Creation is good. If you go back and read Genesis 3, God lays a curse on creation. It's going to produce thorns and thistles. And so creation in response is now groaning. It's longing for 
This day when human beings will be redeemed, when Christians will be redeemed, when resurrected, and a new heaven and a new earth will be brought about. So this begs a question. Is God kind of like the mom in the cat in the hat story who's gone away for a little bit and is going to come home to the kids, the kids being us, and we've like made a mess of everything and he's going to be like, oh my gosh, what have you done to my good perfect world? No. Sorry, I have a four-year-old, cat in the hat, big deal. He's not going to be like that. In fact, God's providence tells us that he's not going to be like that. In fact, he teaches us that God holds all things together. And he does this through two means. I'm going to look at Job chapter 38 to see what I, what a good example of this. In Job 38, God's speaking to Job uh, in a rather interesting conversation. And he tells him that I'm supporting and sustaining creation. Look at what he says in verse 31. Notice how he works from the stars to the heavens to the earth. 31, can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth the Maseroth in their season or can you guide the bear with its children? Those are constellations. Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you establish their rule on earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that a flood of waters may cover you? He's speaking to Job as a man. Can you do this? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are. That's like a military reporting for duty. Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who can number the clouds by wisdom or can tilt the water skins of the heavens when the dust runs into a mass and the clods stick fast together? God supports his creation. God is leading, guiding, controlling everything that is happening on earth. And it starts in space with the constellations. If you know anything about the study of the stars, certain constellations appear at certain times and other ones don't. And the way the, the writer of Job likens it is it's almost like, uh, like God has a chain and he's like, okay, it's your turn, come on out. Like, a, like parading him at the Westminster dog show, but it's like the Westminster Constellation show. And then it's like, good, okay, now it's your turn, here you go. Verse 33 describes the ordinances of heaven. Now in, a, in an ancient Near Eastern mind, that would have been almost what we would say was astrology, the idea that the positioning of the stars affect what's happening on the earth. We wouldn't hold to that as believers, as Christians. We reject that idea. But at the same time, the ordinances of heaven apply. What the sun does in space affects us. What the moon does in space affects us. It affects the tides. It changes how we live around here. God holds all of this together through the laws of physics, through the laws of science, right? That's how God works providentially, through the natural law. Now you may say, okay, well, well it's a law, like, like scientifically, does, does that mean God just, just like sets it up and then walks away? Of course not. That's not how it works. Because if you have a law, you have to have someone to enforce it, right? Otherwise, the laws break. God enforces the laws that he's put in place. And then notice it keeps traveling down, talking about the clouds and rain. God holds in place the water cycle, the places on earth that receive rain, the places on earth that don't receive rain. If it rained on your wedding day, God was in charge of that. If it didn't rain on your wedding day, he was in charge of that. He also probably was in charge of Alanis Morissette writing a song about it. And this all goes down to the dirt on the ground. It talks about the clods, the moist uh, dirt in the ground, crying out for rain or, or, or how dirt, when it's real dry, kind of clumps together. You ever throw a dirt clod at somebody when you're a kid, certainly not as an adult? The ground is crying out, and it's crying out to God for water. And this applies beyond even the picture that Job paints. He just gives us a sample. He holds us together. The atoms that make us together, he holds us together. The atoms that make together our food, he holds it together. He's determined that gravity should work. The cardiovascular system that keeps you alive, the fact that you can even hear my voice as the, the sound reverberates off the walls of this building and, and through a microphone and out into your homes. God is sovereignly in charge of those things, putting them together and making sure that they still work. But it's not just that. He doesn't just hold everything together like really good duct tape. He actually sustains creation. He provides for it. And he gives us three examples of this. He gives us the lion, he gives us the raven, and he gives us the mountain goat. Look at verse uh, 39. Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in the dens or lie in wait in their thicket? Who provides for the raven its prey or with the young ones to cry out to God for help and wander about for lack of food? He's, God provides for different categories here. Look what it says uh, in verse 38. He gives uh, uh, nourishment to a lion. A lion is a symbol of power, right? 
Lions are powerful. Kings want to be like lions, right? And God's saying here in verse uh, 38, 39, I'm the one that hunts the prey for the lion. The powerful are taken care of by God, but also the helpless, because he goes on to talk about satisfying the appetite of the young lions. Did you know that lions are helpless when they're born? When they're born, they're pretty much blind for like three weeks, can't see anything. This powerful, this powerful beast is blind when it's born. Also, uh, they don't hunt for themselves until like the first like three months of their life. They don't start learning to hunt for themselves, this powerful beast. God provides and cares for the helpless. This is why sanctity of life matters for us. As believers, life matters to us. Not just life in the womb, although that's a great illustration of it, but life all the way through to death. I heard Jeff say, from the womb to the tomb, life is significant and matters because God cares for the powerful, yes, but he also cares for the helpless, those who cannot speak up and defend themselves. And one of the ways that he cares for them is to work with us, and we'll talk about that. God also cares for the insignificant. Look at verse 41. Who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God for help and wander about for lack of food? Ravens. Ravens are really insignificant birds, okay? Uh, Nobody cared about ravens. Nobody thought ravens were cool until Edgar Allan Poe wrote a poem about one. And then everybody's like, all ravens, they're cool. But for most of human history, ravens were insignificant birds that nobody, everybody just kind of thought was a pest. And God says, I take care of them. And when their baby birds cry out, we think, we hear it and we think, oh, it's crying out for its mother. It's not crying out for its mother. It's crying out for the God of the universe to provide it with food. We're just sort of numb, deaf to those cries. And then in, verse, in chapter 39, he's talking about a mountain goat and he's telling us that he doesn't need us to take care of his creation. Look at verse one. Do you know when the mountain goat gives birth? Do you observe the calving of the does? Can you number the months that they fulfill? And do you, not, do you know the time when they give birth? When they crouch, bring forth their offspring and are delivered of their young. Their young ones become strong. They grow up in the open. They go out and do not return to them. Mountain goat is an interesting choice here because in an ancient Near Eastern society, we know Job had tons of flocks. He would have had goats. And if you know anything about raising goats, raising livestock, uh, there's this thing called husbandry, which you, which you try to focus on making sure the strongest male mates with the strongest female so you have the strongest herds and flocks possible. And God brings us to a mountain goat, a mountain goat who lives out by itself, and he's like, look, nobody's in charge. There's no human making sure that the strongest male mates with the strongest female so that the mountain goat survives. In fact, I'm the one in charge of it, and somehow they're doing all right. I don't need you to take care of this, Job, and I don't need you human beings to take care of my creation because I'm the one who sustains it and I'm the one who supports it. God is in perpetual action keeping his creation together. You know the reason why your dog doesn't act like a cat? Because God, and some of you are like, my dog kind of does act like a cat. You know why your dog barks instead of meows? Because God doesn't just create and sustain it. He makes sure everything stays the way it should be. That is how deep the providence and power of God runs. Do you know that if God were to, if we were to cease to exist, it would not be an action of God. Thomas Aquinas says it would actually be a cessation of action on God's part. God sustains and supplies his people and his creation. So how do we, what does this do for me and when things feel out of control? Well, one, we need to retreat into Jesus when things feel out of control. Colossians 1, 17 says, in him all things, in Jesus all things hold together. When life is chaotic, when life is overwhelmingly chaotic, we just talked about suffering. That's where eight, uh, Romans eight eighteen started. I don't consider these sufferings to be a, a big deal in the present time. Why is he saying this? Because he's retreating into Jesus. I know that some of you are suffering. I know that some of you have suffered in the past at the hands of abuse, rejection, pain, loss. And whether you were going through that now or whether you you went through it in the past or whether you will go through it in the future, and many of us will have suffering in our future, chaos that waits for us. We have to learn to retreat into Jesus. This is fundamental to our faith. If we don't know to turn to Christ in the midst of it with our everyday uh, issues as well as our big problems that we face, then we don't trust in his providence. We're not trusting in his care. We aren't doing any better than the ravens are. And the ravens are smart enough to, know, to cry out to God for help. 
If you think about Jesus' death, it's a supreme moment of weakness, right? The Messiah, they thought he was gonna, gonna bring in a kingdom. And he's powerless on the cross, seemingly powerless on the cross. And we look to that as Christians, we look to that as the strongest moment. That, that, that's the thing that's gonna win my salvation, that's gonna tether my broken soul back together. I look to the cross and I recognize that I can be forgiven of my sins. And so if I trust Jesus at his apparent weakest to hold together something as fractured and fragile as my soul, why in the world do I not trust him to hold together my everyday pain and suffering? Now that he's raised and risen in glory and power. Brothers and sisters, this is, this is a no-brainer. I know it's hard, but it should be the first place we turn in the midst of pain and suffering. And what do we do when we retreat to Jesus? We ask him to speak into the chaos and suffering of our lives. Hebrews 1.3 says that Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. We know that Jesus is the word of God. John 1 tells us this. It's by the word of God that all things are created. It's by the word of God that it stays in motion and sustains and keeps going. And so chaos is the opposite of creation. And suffering is a form of chaos. Chaos is an unwinding of creation. God abhors chaos. He abhors suffering. And so we ask God to speak into the chaos of our life. Speak scripture. If you're in the midst of chaos, in the midst of suffering, speak scripture into it. Even if you don't know the maybe an appropriate verse for that moment in time, if all you got is John 3, 16, it's not bad, go with it. But what we tend to do is we insert like a four-letter word when we're, when we're frustrated and we're in a chaotic moment. You spill coffee on your lap rather than saying that thing you normally say. How about, for God so loved the world. Whew. And we laugh because it's completely untethered from context. But if God's word holds together the universe, we have been given the gift of his word to speak into the chaos of our lives and the lives of other people. You could do a lot worse than John 3.16. A lot worse. So I just said that God doesn't need us to run his creation. You know what's cool? He still uses us. And this is another thing that we can rely on. We can trust God in the midst of his control. We can trust God to work through all things. Go back to Romans 8. Romans 8, 26 to 27. Likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness for we do not know what, we, what to pray for as we ought, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he's, he who searches hearts knows that it, what is the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Okay, this is a supreme act of cooperation. The Spirit of God living inside of believers, praying on their behalf, is the Spirit of God working with a human being. Now, not everybody has this. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, if you haven't given him your life, you do not have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. This is a unique thing that happens for believers. The Spirit comes to live inside of you when you believe in Christ. But again, this leads us to a, a, an inference we can make, a question we can ask. If God cooperates in this, one of the highest ways he cooperates with a human being, with a mortal, are there other ways that he cooperates? And yes, actually he does. God cooperates through human systems, through natural systems, and through historical processes. Look at Proverbs. Look at Proverbs 8.15. Let's look at the human ways that God cooperates with us. Now, the person speaking in Proverbs 8.15 is wisdom. And wisdom is uh, personified in this passage, speaking to the reader. And wisdom is seen to rest only with God. And so wisdom and God are seen sort of, not the same, but, but very closely related here as we look at 8.15. Wisdom says, by me kings reign and rulers decree what is just. By me princes rule and nobles all who govern Justly, Notice the influence, the control, the sovereignty of God exercises over the highest of human actions. Human government is one of the highest human actions we have. It requires a great deal of thought. There's a reason why uh, democracy didn't just start. It's something that was developed over time. We had to think about it and process it and had to come up with the way we're going to do it. Totalitarian rulers, even those who were the most grievous of rulers. I'm listening to a podcast on dictators right now. Grim stuff. Even they were allowed to rule and reign by the sovereignty and the power and the providence of God, which is difficult to follow and understand sometimes. But it's only by God's wisdom that it's allowed to happen. 
And if God is in control of these levels of government, these levels of human interaction, does that mean he's in control of other things? Yes, absolutely. How many of you had cereal for breakfast this morning? I did. I'm a special K guy myself. Love it. It's good stuff. Recently discovered it. Delicious. I'm not paid anything by Kellogg's, by the way. It was just good. (laughs) Think about how you get your cereal. There's somebody that grows a crop of grain or wheat. If you're a raisin brand person, there's raisins involved, right? And they they harvest the wheat and then they take it. And then there's a truck, right? So I had a a professor at at Dallas Seminary use this analogy. Uh, So they, they get in a truck. So there's somebody that God works through to grow a crop. And then there's somebody that God works through to pave a road so that the truck that God worked through to make, a a human being to make this truck, to drive it to a factory, to put it in a box. Oh, by the way, there's somebody that God worked through to make a box. And then there's somebody that God works through to put it on the shelf at your grocery store. And then there's somebody that God works through uh, in the Food and Drug Administration to make sure that the raisin bran or the special K you get is up to a certain standard so you can eat it. And then there's somebody that God works through. Did you put it in a bowl or did you just spill it on the table? No, you put it in a bowl. God worked through somebody to make a bowl and a spoon and then that milk. We don't even have time to get into dairy farmers. God's providence is working through all sorts of human systems just to get you breakfast. And you think about human beings, human institutions like education. God works through those systems. God works through healthcare. God works through medicine. He works through law. He works through neighbors helping neighbors. God uses all of these processes to care for and sustain not just us, but the entirety of his creation. That's one of the reasons why we have to steward it so well. But look at Proverbs 8, 27, as God works through uh, natural processes as well. He's talking about wisdom again. He says, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the heavens of the deep, when he assigned the sea to its limit so that the waters might not transgress his commands. I'm not going to spend too much time here because we've already kind of talked about natural processes. God works through scientific means, through physics, through chemistry, through, through uh, astronomy, through other things to hold everything together. He partners with the water cycle to bring rain. He partners with the food chain to keep animals fed and to keep population of animals under control so that they don't run rampant. He cooperates with gravity, keep us firmly planted on the earth. There's a reason why we're not spinning off into nowhere. He cooperates with chlorine and sodium to make salt. God has implemented these things and he works through them. It's how he's ordered creation and he's actually made it understandable to some degree for us. This is one of the reasons why I feel like science and faith aren't actually opposed. It's a false dichotomy. Because I believe that if you're a scientist, if you chase down uh, trying to understand how things work. I think ultimately, if, if all fetters were thrown off of us and we were capable of understanding things to their finest degree, you'd have no place to wind up but at the unmoved mover, at the cause of all things, the almighty God. But in some ways, those things are hidden to us. Science and faith go hand in hand. They're like brother and sister. One helps us understand the other. God also works through historical processes. I'm not gonna look at this, uh, I'm not gonna turn here, but there's a passage in Leviticus 25, 38. It's a good example, because God says this a lot. He says to Israel, I am the God who brought you out of Egypt to a land of milk and honey and drove out the Jebusites, the, the Perizzites, the websites, all of it. That is an indication that God is working through history, through historical events. And you might say, well, Travis, that's God working in his people's history, but not people that aren't his people. That's not true. The Egyptians dramatically felt the hand of God when Israel was there through the plagues. And there's other passages that says God will eventually redeem Egypt. They will come and worship him. God is working through historical processes. God was present at the signing of the Declaration of Independence, not because the Declaration was some manifest by God. It's because God is present in all things. God is there present for all things rather, not in all things. God works through the events of human history. God was present on Wednesday when we we, uh, inaugurated a new president. So what does this mean? What does this cooperation mean for me as I deal in the everyday life? Well, one, helps us to deal with failure. Helps us to deal with failure. It's easy to think that your failures might be catastrophic, might be the end of things, but God allows for failure. He has to, because he works with human beings. Just this week, I struggled with failure. I was asked a question in a meeting, 
and I had an answer, uh, but due to what was said pre previously to me answering the question, uh, the answer that I had was no longer valid, uh, which was terrifying. Uh, so I uh, tried to do my best to come up with like an alternate solution, which was rejected out of hand, uh, rightfully so, it wasn't a good idea. And uh, I went out of this meeting feeling like a total failure. I was like, come on, Travis, you should know better than this. And I have this book, it's called Every Moment Holy. If you don't have it, I would highly recommend it. Uh, it's basically a collection of prayers for moments in your life. Just uh, there's one like, I prayed one over here just now before taking the stage. Uh, there's one about getting a new pet. Uh, there's one about, ch there's actually two about changing diapers, which I think is really interesting because I'm like, I don't know, I don't have time to open a book when I'm changing a diaper. But 231, page 231 has how to deal with failure. And it's a conversation between uh, the person praying and uh, a believer, uh, the, the author of the book. And the author says this, indeed Christian take heart in this revelation. The outcomes of your labors were never in your hands, but in God's. You have but one task, to be faithful. The success of your endeavors is not yours to judge. He works in ways that you cannot comprehend, and in his economy there will be no waste. In his economy there will be no waste. Even what you judge as failure, God will tool to greater purpose. God is there working in the midst of our failure. He cooperates in the midst of our failure rescue and redeem those things. In fact, your failure may be God's way of, chosen way of doing something. By all accounts, until he was raised from the grave, Jesus was a failure. He was supposed to be the Messiah that liberated all of Israel, and instead he was killed brutally on a cross. That's a failure until he was raised three days later. The failure that you're undergoing now may lead to a glorious, redemptive resurrection tomorrow. All of us are failures because we've fallen into sin but we have been raised by him to walk in a new life. And that brings us back to Romans 8, 26. The spirit of God living inside of us. We are now vessels. The spirit of God living inside of us. That's not failure, but it couldn't have come without us failing. It also tells us we need to be involved in our communities and our nation. If God cooperates through these powers, through these institutions, we should be uh, cooperating with them as well. It's why I love our work in Victory. It's, Victory, it's why I love our work in Jack Lowe Elementary. God is present working through the people in those institutions and we should be too as the people of God. To reject work with them is to reject the providence of God. So where's all this going? If God's behind the wheel of this universe and we're along for the ride, where's, where's he taking us, right? Where's he taking us? Well, Romans 8, 28, we can go back there. We'll be there the rest of the time. Tells us exactly where he's taking us. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. God is bringing all things together. He's gonna bring all things together. Everything is being providentially guided to its ultimate conclusion. So what is, let's break this 828 down because we talk about it a lot. What, is, what does it mean? What does Paul mean by all things? Well, I am not a Greek expert, but it means all things. Like all things, everything. Good things, bad things, uh, happy things, sad things. But here's some concrete examples in case you need some because all things is kind of big. These are the things that God is working together in your life for the good, birthday parties, promotions, Netflix, the five mile run that you will take today, the five mile run you will not take today, the thought that a five mile run could make you violently ill. God is working through all those things. The feeling of loneliness that you have at the end of every day, God is working with that. The struggle to get out of bed tomorrow morning, God will work with that. The joy of finishing work on a Friday, God is working with that. Good friends, bad friends, good decisions, bad decisions, your marriage, your divorce, your wedding that won't happen, the kids you have, the kids you don't. God is working through all things. And it says that he works together. What does this mean? Does this mean that God is the author of good things and bad things? He's the author of evil? No, of course not. God is not the author of evil. Have you ever put a puzzle together? Hopefully that answer is yes. If you haven't, like go buy one. It's very relaxing. But when you put a puzzle together, you're trying to shape things into an image, right? You've been given a certain set of pieces and you're piecing them together to make things look a certain way. God takes the circumstances in our events. And yes, he's sovereignly in control of everything that happens. I believe that wholeheartedly. 
Nothing catches him by surprise. But God takes those things and he's putting them together like a puzzle. What is he putting it together? What's the picture on the box? It's the good. And the good is Jesus Christ. In verse 8, 29, it says, uh, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He wants us to be like Jesus. He wants us to make us more like Christ. This is why he's done what he's done. This is why he provides for us. Everything in our life is designed to bring us to that central port. And everything in our lives is designed, if we do not know him, for us to be called to him. He beckons to us and says, come, join me. I want to know you. I want to draw close to you. I've cared for you. I've raised you. I love you. I loved you so much that I sent my son to die for you. And if you'll put your faith in him rather than in yourself to care for everything, if you'll put your faith in his cross to satisfy the debt between you and me, then we can have a relationship and you can get to know me. And I think you'll find, as Jesus said, that I am gentle and humble and my burden is light. And this is the primary reason why you can trust God when everything gets out of control. is because he is bringing everything to a perfect conclusion. You're not the author of the story. You don't write your destiny. You're not, you're not in charge. You don't get to speak anything into the universe and take charge of it. That's not how it works. It's a novel thought. But I can't trust myself. If that's true, I would wreck everything. I'm a verbal person. I say a lot of things. You don't get to just speak things. Let's trust God. In fact, uh, Jacques-Marie-Louis Monsabre, and yes, I practiced that name, who was the rector at Notre Dame Cathedral, said this, if God conceded me his omnipotence for 24 hours, I would make many changes in the world. But if he gave me his wisdom too, I would leave things as they are. God's providence tells us that we will be complete. He's bringing all things to its proper conclusion. And he has the power and the wisdom and the knowledge to accomplish that purpose. And it's a good purpose. So what do we do with that? Well, one, we need to persevere. Keep going. I know it's hard. I know things are chaotic. When you're in the midst of chaos, you can feel like, man, I just want to give up. This Christian thing's not working out for me. God's not listening to me. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep going. And that doesn't mean you have to keep going by yourself if you need help. That's what the body of Christ is for. That's what the church is for. We want to come alongside you. I need help and I've gotten it from this place. You can too. They'll accept me, they'll accept anybody. So we keep persevering, we keep going. We also need to be in the word and spend time in prayer. Uh, If somebody pulled up in a car outside this church as you're leaving today and said, get in, and you didn't know them, would you get in? Public service announcement, don't get in. Don't get in cars with people that you don't know. Just word of wise. So if God is controlling everything, and he's driving this to its perfect conclusion, he's behind the wheel, shouldn't we get to know him? If he's shaping me and conforming me into the image of his son, shouldn't I spend time with him to make sure that like, this guy knows where he's going? He does, but I can tell you that to him, about him because I know him. One of the reasons why we are uncertain in our relationship with the Lord is because maybe we don't know him as well as we think we do. Now granted, there are sometimes some seasons where yeah, God seems distant and that's normal but we draw closer to him. Our website, pcbc.org slash media slash devotional resources. There are some great resources for believers there. Great resources. I know some of them are great because I help pick them. But there's some on there too that I didn't have anything to do with and I'm like, man, that looks really awesome. Studying the scriptures on your own, yeah, you can do that, but we often need help to understand. It's a multi-thousand year old book. There's some weird stuff in there and sometimes you need help talking about it and that's okay. Get to know the God who is guiding all things. Get to know him, draw close to him because he's holding everything together, whether we acknowledge it or not. He's sustaining it and he's supporting it. He's working with it. So the things that are here, he's working through to accomplish his good purposes, all to guide it to a perfect conclusion, a new heaven and a new earth populated with his people who have been glorified in him. So let's praise him and worship him about a great God, a great, great God who has done such great things to care for us. Because that's ultimately the, the main application here, is to give God all of your worship for his care and his love. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for your care for us, for your care for me. I, we would not be anywhere without your hand. 
we would be nowhere, we would be nothing. We would have no value apart from you. And so God, I pray for everybody here, everybody watching online, I pray that we would not neglect to remember the great acts that you perform on our behalf every single day just to keep us breathing, just to keep us going, and just to keep this world going, all because you love us so much. God, remind us of your love in every action we take that we might remember the care God has for us. That's in your son's name we pray, amen.